Okay, um, let's go ahead and get going. Um, this is the Yocto Project BOF. Um, for people that haven't been to a BOF before, this is BOF means birds of a feather. And I believe the saying is birds of a feather flock together. And this is a word left over from the good old Unix days. Um, if there's anyone curious why it's called a BOF and what the BOF is, basically this is a time for me to talk a little bit, summarize some stuff that has happened in the past, since the last conference, basically. And then we can go into more of an interactive format, you know, questions, answers. If you have questions, there are people here who can probably answer them. Um, so it'll be pretty free form and interaction with people in the audience is sort of the point of this exercise. And Paul, if you could get a mic from Joshua and sit on the other side of the room. Um, so that was the welcome speech. Um, welcome to the BOF. Your MC is, uh, normally it would probably be Joseph, the Yocto jester, but he's just got done with a week at Embedded World and wants a week off. Um, so I have been drafted as your master of ceremonies today. I've been doing uh, Yocto Project since before Yocto Project was a thing. Um, so I sit on the open embedded board along with uh, Tim here. Um, I am the, the, the Yocto Project charter names open embedded as the technical partner. And we have a representative that goes to the Yocto Project advisory board meetings and that is usually me. Um, I don't, I'm basically a consultant, so if you ask for my title, I will write Minister of Progress, which a friend of mine made up many, many years ago. And I work professionally as OpenSDR, which is Software Defined Radio. And most of that work is building distributions for small software radios using the Octo Project. And I've been doing that for quite some time at this point. Um, so we'll cover the newsy stuff. And then we'll have a little bit more. The leadership group, Andy Waffa, who is supposed to be here today, um, who is late, probably because I was late to one of his functions once, has been reelected as the uh, Yocto Project Advisory Board Chair. And Stephen Jiri um, has been reelected as the treasurer. Um, these are basically the two most important positions on, in the Yocto Project is you complain to Waffa if you have problems, and you ask Stephen for money. Um, the other big news in the last several months to a year is the German government created this thing called the Sovereign Tech Fund, who approached the Octo Project about funding some of our maintainer gaps. And we were able to take the five-year plan that had been de developed a few years ago, and Megan and Andy covered this in a talk that hopefully most of you saw. But the end result was we were able to um, do some new work, some work that we knew existed that had been neglected. And so we've got a VS Code plugin, which is very popular. Um, what is VS Code, an editor? Um, <laughs> Okay, I've been around, I've been doing this for a long time and I use VI. Um, and it just so happens that I have the Yocto plugin on this laptop because I've also been looking at Meshtastic and had installed visual code so I could build the firmware for it. So I was very quickly to install the plugin, which is on my list of homework for when I go home from here, is to learn how to use that. Um, they talked about patch tests, which is basically automatic testing of patches before maintainers have to review them. Um, we're looking at publishing a binary distro so that you can prototype things from a specific distro config very quickly. Um, Toaster has received some work, so it basically works in master now. And it works, it basically a lot of stuff has been cleaned up in it and I've been showing it to some people here um, through the event to kind of show them and encourage them to try to use Toaster. And if anyone has Toaster questions, I can run you through a very little demo um, probably after the boff and some more stuff. So we're currently wrapping up the uh, Sovereign Tech Fund work 
And if you have, one of the things that I hope to get out of this BOF is ideas for new projects so that as, we, as funding becomes available, we can actually get work done. Uh, the website has been revamped. Uh, I don't know how many of you work with websites, but they're a lot harder than they look. And the website had sort of stagnated for a while uh, for various reasons, and it's now in a state where we can actually edit it and update it again, so we can all give Megan a round of applause even though she's not here. Um, so once again, there was a talk, The Road to Scarf Gap, that Tim gave. Um, so this will be the next LTS, and that is going to be released real soon now. Um, and it will receive four years of maintenance. So this is basically the replacement for Dunfell, which will go end of life very soon now. When does it go end of life, Tim? Um, the last go is like next week. OK. So basically, Dunfell will go end of life, and Scarth Gap will receive um, LTS support. And this is where I ask, who here is using builds older than Dunfell? Who here is using Dunfell? Who here is using Kirkston? Who here is using what will become Scarth Gap? I like the one guy who just doesn't <laughs> move his hand. Is anyone using things between Dunfell, Kirkston, and Scarth Gap? OK. That, that's a very good number, um, because at least people are gravitating onto the LTS releases. Other cool stuff. OK, so upcoming events. Um, uh, if you were in the embedded Linux update this morning, we heard Tim talk about the attempts at splitting EOS off to sort of its own standalone event. They tried that for various reasons that you have to ask Tim in the hall. Uh, apparently, we've gone back to embedded events twice a year, co-located with the OSS, uh, which is good and bad. It's, you know, some of us like to see other stuff, and it's also nice to have the small more uh, the smaller format is also nice for some things. So Vienna, third week of September, there's OSS, ELC, and plumbers. Um, and I get a couple questions about this because we had a build systems microconference at plumbers last year in Richmond. I have a proposal in for that, but they are taking longer to review than expected due to excessive requests for microconferences, including one from Tim. Uh, there will be a Yocto event planned, and it will be announced real soon now. All right. Don't mind me. OK, and since I'm wearing an Open Embedded shirt, um, Open Embedded is the technical partner of the Yocto project. Um, it is an individual membership organization. If you would like to join, uh, the main reason to join is it gets you a vote on one of two on two seats for the Yocto Project TSC. Uh, send a short biography of you and why you care about Open Embedded and the Yocto Project to board at openembedded.org, and we will batch it up and have the members vote you in um, as we get enough to run a vote. Um, and there's a wiki page that also talks about membership. We did a workshop Monday after FOSDEM that we had about 35 people there, which was the capacity of the room. There are videos for that on the Open Embedded YouTube channel, and I suggest that everyone take a look at those. Uh, we most likely will organize another workshop after FOSDEM. It will sort of depend on other co-located events and runway and can we reserve space. And they don't announce the, really announce the dates for FOSDEM until late August. So we basically have to start planning for an event in February in very late August. Um, that said, yeah, we've been running one in, uh, in Brussels and we always have the conversation is can we run sort of small workshops with 
talks about open and better than the Yocto project in your hometown. Um, so if you have ideas for locations where you think we could fill a room with about 30 to 40 people and have people show up to give talks. Um, I mean, these are run very low budget. The one in Brussels is basically 75 to 100 euros. There's an option for you to be generous. Thank you for everyone that has paid the generous price. Uh, so we, as in the Open Embedded Board, can run l workshops fairly easily. Um, you know, we, we know how to do all the billing and everything. What we don't know is where to have them, when to have them, and who will speak. So please talk to me, talk to Tim. Uh, we are basically the local reps for that at this event. And with that, um, I know that at least a couple of talks, the conversations were running over or be going deeper into the weeds. And this is the part where I stop talking and you start talking. So, and I know I tried to prime some of you with questions. That's not. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question. Um, we've just gone through a phase of a lot of five-year planning work. Um, and so basically, the five-year plan is now not much, so much a plan as either stuff in flight or being done. What do people need from the Yocto project um, in the next five years? Marta. Uh, wait for the microphone. Um, as we plan for the next five years, do not forget the CRA. It, do not forget what? The CRA, yeah. the yes. Cyber Resilience Act. Um, so the CRA is, to me, a very broad nebulous thing. And what we need are people who understand the CRA and its implications to convert that into things that are actionable. Understand completely. Um, even for me, currently, CRA is completely nebulous because the yeah. standards are not there. But as it's going to be to apply in 2027, probably, so mm -hmm. inside the five years, um, and the standards will be kind of done next year normally. So then we'll have only two years for any adjustments that that may be necessary. So taking that into, taking the buffer for that in the five years plan, for me, it seems that that will be an important thing. So, so basically, as, as a project, we need to be paying attention. So basically, as I'm, I'm going to turn this around as people impacted by the CRA, um, it's going to be a lot better if you tell us what we need to do to make sure that we are ready to deliver Linux distributions in a post-CRA world. Um, is there, even if it's not explicitly part of the CRA, is there things we could do that would be generally a good idea before then that would make it easier? Does that make sense? Yeah, because like that can be helpful. Like everyone wants their stuff to be more secure, so even if it's not specifically part of the CRA today, there might be some stuff we can do to help with that early, right? But yeah, actionable things are good. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, what we've already got, you know, the SBOM stuff pretty well in place. We've, we've got representation for the SPDX3. Um, we're getting ready to move to the new CVE formats and stuff like that, right? So. Are, there's got to be more than these concrete items, right? That's that's the question. So, what are the other concrete items? Yeah, I mean that's a hard one. And I don't follow the CRA as much, in spite of all the stuff I put on my badge. Um, really, what we're saying is there's. You could say that you know the Octo project is done. We can build embedded Linux distributions today. 
but the reality is um, we have room to work. So the security people have, I mean, Joshua Locke's talk at Plumbers about Salsa and doing builds, Linux system builds, is just fascinating. It gives you a lot of ideas. And so there's always room for improvement. And I would also like to ask everyone to please run the visual code thing and how can we make life better for individual developers and Chuck. Thank you. Um, so I work in safety critical area. <clears throat> um, yeah. I think one of the impedance mismatches between the general culture of the project and the way at least aerospace safety critical works is that no, it's not okay to allow developers to sort of float to the front edge of whatever Kirkston or whatever release you're on. That's actually not okay to do. We don't allow developers to do that. We have a very careful lockstep process where we unleash the floodgates from one hash to the next. Project leadership will look at everything that rolls in, do a very careful analysis before we then open the door to the next set of hashes as the head moves. We call that floating up but we do not let individual developers just sort of pull down their own layers and mirror. It's all kept in lockstep. It has to be that way because we have to count for what developers do. So for example, um, I really like setup layers, right? I like that script, but we are not gonna have developers like run the, what it, the script that uh, creates that. What was it called? Uh, the build layers or the, the, yeah, the, the, build the layer we are not, developers are not going to run that. That will never happen. Okay, we set up the developers with the setup layer script that that creates, the layer setup JSON, and then that's the thing we check in to do lockstep changes. Mm -hmm. Developers just get that change when they pull. That's the way it's got to work. We don't have a tool for a project leader to say, I want to update the setup layers JSON file and update our mirrors, which by the way, we also have to keep carefully um, bit for bit identical to upstream because we have to reproduce that build 30, 40 years from now. So um, I, have, I put in an RFC in for a, a script mm -hmm. to say um, this will update the mirrors, update that hash, and I think that was orthogonal to the thinking of the project. So I'd like to sort of like open up the dialogue uh, on that and say that that's something we need. Um, having to maintain that separately, that, that wasn't considered desirable. So, um, and I, I, there's some other stuff, but I, I'll, I'll just drop that one and we can, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the very first phase of this, we're trying to focus entirely on you know, new user experience, right? And so, a whole bunch of us, including me, are just trying to patiently wait for that part, right, to get solidified. Trust me, we all want things like what you're talking about. Okay, and so cool. we're just going to wait to unleash the floodgates a little bit. So I have a bigger question. How many people in the room would be interested in such a thing? Okay, so... Yeah, the so idea is you is, run the script, it, it updates all your mirrors yeah. to where the upstream head is and updates your JSON. Then you commit that and you can document, I've now made a change, I've yeah. now floated up. So we did a panel on Tuesday? Yeah. 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 Tuesday or Monday? I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> it was Monday. Monday. It was yeah. on Monday. And one of the, you know, in, in preparing for the panel, you know, clearly Chuck's application is just not, in line with what many, many people here use the Octo project for. But one of the things we're looking for are common pieces that everyone cares about that make, you know, there's no sense, you know, heavily customizing the Octo project for your specific thing, except where you need to customize. There are going to be a lot of places that we share things. And the more shared stuff we have that is boring and non-business specific, uh, I think the better we make the Yocto project. So okay. there's, there is setup stuff in process now. And you know, definitely pay attention to the patches and the discussion there if you care about you know, build configuration and setup and managing how updates occur. So the, the current use case that automotive uses is based off of repo. I know that's orthogonal to this, yeah. but it's the same kind of thing. 
where they're specifically giving you a XML file that lists out exact hashes for every single component. Yeah. So I, I, if it's a use case, if, if automotive is going to be continued, with, it's probably a use case that has to be addressed anyways. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people with a lot of solutions for layer setup stuff, and that's, uh, if you follow the discussion, sometimes people get quite heated and have strong opinions. Um, and that's one of the reasons there is, there are many choices because everyone's use case is slightly different. I mean, I use submodules because I know how to use Git. And I used to use repo and I hate it. Um, but the first time I used repo, it was best in the class at the time. So things change. And when you're working on layer setup stuff, if anyone here listening is actually working on layer setup stuff, you're going to have to do a really good job to replace some of the existing workflows that people are using. Um, yeah, and if you, if you want to get involved in that, like if you want to figure out what the new layer setup stuff doesn't do that your personal custom solution does, then please give us that feedback. Yeah, as we definitely... I, I, I think what I'm saying is, you know, we can look at the solutions that people have been passionate about, but what we really need to hear from are people who, you know, are going to use it and, you know, make sure that we don't create yet another tool that misses one or two points. And then they go back to using whatever it is they used. So, so we might do that carefully instead of quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's, layer setup is just definitely a very passionate, interesting, weedy. There are a lot of different, you know, I do a lot of development, so I like to have all my stuff as Git repos. The people doing CI stuff like to use CAS because they have a file that explains a lot more than I can codify in a Git submodule tree. So if you go back a few years, I gave a talk um, living on master and everything was Git submodule based, right? So I know how to use Git too, right? Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm patiently waiting for some stuff to land and be, you know, flushed out and everything, right? My intent is to take things like bit bake layers, layer index fetch, and add a dash dash submodule to that. So it will now, you know, do that is with submodules, right? My intent is all to put that into the setup layers setup process so that one of your options would be to do submodules. But I don't want to muddy the water with the design and everything that's happening now. I'm going to wait, and then I will do that. But I'm already working on some, my own tooling to make sure I know what the heck I need to know to make that ready. Yeah, I, I mean, this is basically, the, if you want to see something happen, participate in the process. Don't complain after someone spent six months having discussions and then chime in with just one more step. Um, does anyone have anything else? Problems, questions? There are a lot of experts in the room. Yeah, it's related to what you said about the Visual Studio plugin. For like new developers, it was really, really useful. Can onboard the developer from many background and the thing that's always come up from my teams, it's it's all to push but to send patches upstream. Like the the setup for new developer that's come from Windows or they're not used to work with, with patches, mm. it's like, oh no, I won't do that because it will take uh, I know uh, an a night but not the night, but an, an evening to set up to configure mails and join the mailing list. So I don't know it full, they will have like a better way to contribute up, upstream. Or it can be improved, like for for projects like GitHub, you can just push, open a PR, and it's kind of make its way. I I know it's not going to be like that, but for other projects, it's yeah. really more you friendly for new developer. Um, no, 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 no. There are no forbidden topics. I, I it is a controversial topic um, due to some workflows that are involved. And uh, so first of all, my personal opinion is the project should not depend on proprietary software for workflows. I wear my open source hippie hat, but I know people have looked at GitLab, which kind of removes that objection. Um, I will say that uh, Chem is pretty good about watching pull requests against Meta OE or Meta Open Embedded. So some layers are definitely a lot more open to diff different workflows. 
Open Embedded Core is driving an auto builder cluster and the workflow of those developers is very much driven by uh, patches on mailing lists, unfortunately, and it would be somewhat challenging to convert to a pull request base. And Paul. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask a uh, poll of the audience, if, has anyone been involved in an open source project where they've used one of the recent sort of um, mailing list to web interface uh, front ends and has it been successful? Anyone? B4? Are you talking about B4 and lore? I mean, which part of the tool chain do you mean? Like for making it easier to send patches or to receive the patches and know if it's applied or this kind of thing? Paul, use the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Patchwork doesn't necessarily help you submit the patch, which is kind of what we're driving at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole, the, I mean, the whole workflow is important, I suppose. But um, I mean, for a lot of people, just getting s or having to be signed up to the mailing list for part of the process is a is a problem. I mean, just being able to send email through the system that we have to deal with <laughs> is horrible. Yeah, sending sending patches via email is actually difficult. I mean, I'm good at it and I know how to do it, but I understand that it is pretty tricky. I mean, I, have to, I think I use Gmail as a relay. So, yeah, so we talked about this a lot in Prague also. We've been talking about it for years, right? But um, so, you know, we're not going to switch the project over to be pull request based or these kind of things, right? But that doesn't mean we can't do this. So what do you do? Enhance in parallel. So I have already done quite a bit of architect design on this particular thing. But it's just not, we didn't get all the tooling and everything ready yet. So it's not ready for me to open it up for more discussion. Because more and more discussion is just more bike shedding. But I do have some very concrete ideas that can make this work and do absolutely nothing to disrupt the current workflow at all. It's, it's literally enhanced in parallel. Yeah, I mean, workflows is a very sensitive issue. I mean, I'm sure it's come up in other projects. And the point you're making is, I mean, we hear. It's just difficult to re-engineer um, an entire workflow. Yes? Oh. Yeah. OK, okay I so, guess. Hmm? Yeah, you go. OK. And there's one person in front of you also with a oh. microphone. You wait. OK. So um, I really appreciate all the work that has been done with uh, CVEs. And I also observe that there are some projects, uh, specifically I'm thinking of, that don't really seem to use the CVE uh, database, don't seem to get assignments. And I'm just curious as to uh, if there are or if help is needed or anything along um, getting some of these additional projects. Like I think Rust crates, for example, is one thing I'm thinking about. Um, or other, like, I think there's also, like, what, OSV, potentially? I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm, I don't know. Like, I haven't been paying attention, sorry. Supplemental so. database. Yes, <laughs> supplemental database. Yes. Uh, I, in spite of wearing security flare, know very little about security other than the fact that these are very good questions. Do you know, <laughs> Marta? Wait until next week, okay? Okay. Wait until next week. That, hopefully that's a great answer. And does that cover your... Okay. So, sorry, it was back, back to the other subject about workflow. I yeah. think one of the big issues, of course, contributing can be a bit hard, especially in a company environment where you yep. don't have a mail that can actually send stuff to yep. you. No. But also well following the patch, so as a drive-by contributor, doing a patch eventually, it's it's kind of hard to follow where are you in the process uh, yep. without being monitoring the mailing list, sorry. Yep. So um, have you looked at like lore? It will let you um, basically give you filters and you can kind of, I'm very sensitive to the mailing list problem because I spent, my mail provider spent a month um, 
groups thought I would spend a month or so in spam cops blacklist on my mail provider. So I stopped getting project emails. And that was great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was basically on vacation for most of that month. My mail flow dropped dramatically. And I'm like, this is life changing. And I need to think about how I look at mailing lists. But it's kind of my, I totally understand the drive by. We totally have a problem where you're at in the cycle of a patch. Um, patch test at least helps because it is going to screen your patch ahead of time and tell you if there's anything stupid and mail you, you know, the easy stuff for the reviewers. So you will, do you get a mail that says your patch worked? No, and that's my question. Why don't we get that? I mean, for all the projects, the big open source projects, you are informed once your patch is accepted, but not for Yocto and yeah, not I for BitBank. I know, I know. I, this is not the first time I've heard this. Um, and if we uh, this is that? gonna come under the, we are listening, and I think patch test, patch test definitely should might say that you send you a, an email saying your patch worked. Um, yeah, that could maybe be like a conditional thing. Like if it succeeds, maybe just send an email to the, the author. But you can imagine if we had it reply with a positive to every single patch that was submitted, the uh, mailing list would explode. So. Yeah, I was thinking individually just to, hey, it passed patch test. Now it's up to humans to merge. Is a, is a step in the right direction. Yeah. Actually, I was asking about just getting informed once it was accepted or applied. Yeah, I know, I know. So then I, that I know when to update. Yeah. It was certainly uh, the workflow we wanted to get to when we would, because some of this stuff has been going on for quite some time and it's taken us a very long time to get to a point where, uh, you know, even where we are now. Um, but yeah, we, we did want to have automated, you know, when, when your thing gets into master next, so it's under test, and then again, again when it actually goes into master. And, and then those are points we can detect quite easily, but yeah, the, the, the automation is not there yet. But. Well, it's not really a, well, it's kind of a question, but what we're discussing here is a lot of uh, we're discussing workflows, and then we are discussing different requirements, small toolings, extra toolings, and I think it, it might be worth, I, I'm not saying anything new, and I'm not saying yeah. that anybody I mean, is not thinking what, enough. but the word is value add. I would yeah. prefer that Yocto Project spend as much as possible uh, effort on what is actually Yocto Project, and there are any time spent on tooling workflow is necessary evil because we really should ma be making Yocto, which is embedded software. So when, when we spend time on uh, creating bots, monitoring mailing lists, sending out mails, that might be necessary. But it, uh, as Tim says, we will not be switching to pull request. That's an op opinion. But the more we spend on Custom tooling, you said it yourself in your talk that you were very happy that some things got removed. Mm -hmm. As time goes by, we should consider how much effort are we willing to put into our own custom tooling instead of going with something that already has a lot of stuff yeah. and then spend time on doing embedded software. Yeah, I, that I think, so let's kind of wrap up the tooling because we're going to have five minutes, and I want to see if anyone else has questions. But I really like yours is we need to get the focus on building Linux distributions and delivering higher quality, covering more of these buzzwords in ways that our managers want. You know, Basically, we want management to like, hey, you have to use this Yocto project stuff because it takes checks off all these. And if you go and talk to your manager about workflows and emails and blah, blah, blah. They're like, Ugh, what are you doing? You're not doing what I told you to do, which is deliver Linux distributions. Um, so we have five minutes. Do we have any new topics? OK, this is a very naive question. But what is the, what drove the Sovereign Tech Fund to 
value Yocto? Because I mean, I've tried to get other so projects through. I'm going to tell. Curious. I'm going to tell you what I think, and I may or may not be right. But um, so apparently, someone in the German government realized they needed to spend money on some of this stuff that they depend on, and there was a trial run that um, they did that was very small. And around that time, Richard also had an article in LWN about the trials and the difficulties of a maintainer, um, you know, where basically you've, your user base has exploded. Um, you know, we have no idea how many devices running Linux built with the Octo project there are in the wild. But, I mean, it, the room is pretty full here. And we get a lot of you know, questions, and we see a lot of stuff, so we know there's a lot of people out there using it. And at the same time, I mean, I've said it before, is the Yocto Project's measure of success is all the people I know that used to do a lot of, like, core support work now have full-time jobs for companies delivering product based on it. And what that has led to is Richard's workload going up, up, up. And so he wrote an article about this, and someone in the sovereign tech fund circles saw this article and was like, oh, we should ask these guys, you know, what they have, you know, how we can help. And we happen to have a five-year plan on hand that led to us being able to get some work spun up fairly quickly. That's my rough outline of the background as I understand it. I guess my obvious next thing is you need another five-year plan exactly. to go back to them with. Yes. And that was your leading question that at was the beginning. That was my leading question. So I'm, I, I don't know if we've gotten there with tooling. So what do you want to, um, wh what's the direction? All these <laughs> flags. I mean, I, you know, I want to go back and look at Joshua Locke's talk on supply chain security and build systems and try and line up um, things that we don't have well covered, or at least have good, you know, understand where we sit in supply chain security. I mean, we have S bombs, but there's a lot of levels of, you know, building secure Linux distributions. And I said that word to someone last night, and they said, "What do you mean?" And I don't know what I mean, because um, there's a lot of aspects to that. And from my point of view. You know, we started building Linux distributions for Sharp Zaruses, and now we're building Linux distributions for tractors and spacecraft and cars. And, you know, we need to make sure that we're building what we said we were going to build and that people cannot interfere with what we build. And that helps everyone. And so, a lot, you know, you hear about security. Well, I don't care about security. Well, you do, because it will improve you know, the ability for us to predictably build the software you want in your device. Y Yocto is pretty unique in what it does, and I think it can solve a lot more problems than the embedded people think about on a regular basis. I mean, I <laughs> so, so if you notice, I try to force myself to stop saying embedded Linux distributions. I say Linux distributions because, um, I mean, we've had talks about people building containers. We Clearly, we're building for some very things that are hard to consider embedded. Um, so it really has become a Swiss army knife for building custom Linux distributions for all sorts of applications. One more question or answer. Is it going about tooling or? Uh, <laughs> Um, this morning, I was not aware, they dropped the kernel LTS to two years now, support? Yeah. For the six, and Yocto still have, like, uh, I think LTS is four years, and LTS was like guaranteed to stay with the same major version kernel, so what will be the plan for that? Do you remember what that is? <laughs> okay. Um, so I had another conversation with somebody else who was requesting each LTS go into SCARF gap, each LTS kernel go into SCARF gap. So that's a discussion that's going to happen. However, we did absolutely commit to during the during the SCARF gap release, we will have a kernel update to a new LTS. I don't remember what we actually said we were committing to. I think it was yeah. midway, like at two years. Yeah. But we have had uh, one of our largest sponsors come and ask for every year 
but they're af asking actually for other sponsors to join in to fund that, right? Let's resource that so that that actually is totally doable. It's not Richard doing it. It's not Bruce Ashfield doing it, right? It's not, it's not one more of the, some guy in Nebraska at the bottom of the, you know, XD comic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, we are absolutely going to be updating the kernel, absolutely. And meanwhile, we've got uh, mix-in layers for other things. So, like, I've already started a U-boot um, mix-in layer for Scarth Gap because we absolutely have to have new U-boot in the modern world. There's too many devices coming out that need new things. Yeah. I mean, the summary there is LTS stuff is hard. Um, the Arctic Project LTS is our best effort. Um, clearly, the commercial aerospace guys plan on supporting this for 35 years, which I think is one of the great reasons to use the Octo Project is you can choose your life cycle. You know, you're not, some guy's not going to tell you 10 years. You're going to like, I can go to Wind River, for example, and buy support from them. And if I don't like them, I can take my build files, put them in a house, and support it for as long as I need to support it. And you're not dependent on any one vendor to uh, give you your support for whatever time frame you need. And I'm now two minutes over. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>